are in Ezekiel, and we're in chapter 6, and tonight from here through a big portion of the early part of this, you're going to see God's bringing judgment after judgment. He's bringing, uh, he's setting up his case to show you that he's a just God and how many times he gives uh, favor to, to let people respond and repent, come back, and he's more than willing to help them, but he's also a God that's bringing consequences for long-term choices in uh, Israel's life. And you're going to see from this point on, and, and if you haven't read chapter 7 next week, you'll, you'll definitely be able to see some parallels between Ezekiel's world. This is now, we're right at about 590 B.C., still about four years before the temple is going to be totally destroyed and the third wave is going to come. Um, so let's talk about some parallels between Ezekiel's world and, and our world. Ezekiel's world parallels ours right now in so many ways. One, God is communicating through weird acts. Ezekiel was communicating back there in, in 590 so through so many weird acts. Remember all the many different things that God asked him to do? Lay on one side for so many days and then lay on another side for 40 more days and, and to build these clay bricks and draw the temple and put like there's things almost like child's play and the people would come and watch them. So God was communicating through Ezekiel and weird acts. God is communicating to our world today through many weird acts that people are not understanding. How many got to see the, the blood red moon? Now, I talked with Carol and my neighbor came across while we were out in our driveway. That's where the best we could see it from um, came over. And something unique happened. I was, I was concerned that we might not be able to see the blood red moon. That's God speaking because of the cloud cover. And oh my goodness, it cleared up. And I don't know if you saw this, but there was a point where all of a sudden it was like a switch was thrown and the stars were there so brilliantly. Now, did that happen in your area at all? But all of a sudden you go, look at all those stars. Okay, so that happened. A couple other noticed that. And, and I thought about this. If this is God communicating in such a weird way through the, through the sun, moon, and stars as Jesus said he would, is it possible that when God puts his communication up there, all the heavens rejoice and the host of heavens brighten up and say, this is our God speaking. And that's just the thought that I had when it happened. I went, wow, it's like all of heaven saying this sign is God speaking to a people he wants to warn. Hmm. Uh, so I, I put that parallel in there. Um, and of course, you know all over the five years how God has been communicating through weird ways to our world. Now, the second thing in this is that 70 times God declares that they shall know that I am the Lord. How is that a, that's, that's in the book of Ezekiel. He makes that phrase 70 times. God declares, they shall know that I am the Lord. So what would be the parallel with that for our world right now? We are in the 70th time that God says, I made these dry bones come back to life. 70 years in a row, he's saying, you see that nation called Israel? They weren't here for 1,878 years. They're back. So we have a 70 times of a reminder, God can restore a nation that was dispersed all over for almost two, two millenniums. Amazing. So I see that 70 times that he declares to Israel, back in the book of Ezekiel, you'll see how many times he does this. If Now that you know of it, when you see that, put a little mark by it. Put, you know, the first time you see it, the second time, and uh, count along it that you'll see God's faithfulness to declare to the people 70 times that they shall know, not they might know, not they could know, not they would say, ah, I think he is. He's making a demonstrative statement. They shall know I am the Lord. Now, that speaks also to the future part that every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that 
Jesus is Lord. You, you see why it's important sometimes to look at the parallels that take place? Now, that brought me to this portion in this. One of the major problems, number three, now I'm using what we have in our world, and I'm going to parallel it back to theirs. 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, our job is to persuade others. The problem back in Ezekiel's day, they didn't fear God. They said God's on our side. And they were listening to the false prophets that God's going to take care of them. He's going to meet their needs. And God always rescues his people, Israel, you know. And, and so, uh, but it says in our day, we will learn something, the fear of the Lord. Now, to be honest with you, when I look at the church, when I talk about the body of Christ, there is a obvious emphasis on Jesus love only and the fear of the Lord has been silenced once again hmm. so when the apostles and Paul wrote this that since then we know what it is to what fear the Lord we will try to persuade others that was Ezekiel's job they knew that in the first century church here in this 21st century church, we don't seem to know what it means to fear the Lord anymore. And we're going to talk more about that here uh, tonight. The fourth uh, parallel between Ezekiel's world and our world is this. Israel had lost the fear of the Lord, and so has America, not just the church. Now we're talking nations. There was the spiritual Israel and the nation of Israel. They lost what it was to fear the Lord, the spiritual side of them. And our spiritual side, the church, has lost it. As a nation, they lost fear of the Lord. And as a nation, see how this parallel goes really deeper? As a governing body, we've lost the fear of the Lord. Well, it's very sobering truths that we look at here in this way. And um, I'm going to share some other things that, that has been coming to light in the, the great falling away that the Bible predicts will take place before he returns. But let's get into Ezekiel now, chapter 6. Ezekiel chapter 6. And uh, last week he got his hair cut, if you remember that. And he did all these one-thirds with his hair. This week he's going to be speaking to the mountains. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, and again, for anybody that's just picking this up, that's not a reference to Jesus, that's a reference to Adam, actually, son of dust. It's going back to his humanity here. He's speaking to Ezekiel. Set your face against the mountains of Israel. Prophesy against them and say, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of the sovereign Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and the valleys. I am about to bring a sword against you, and I will destroy your high places. Your altars will be demolished, and your incense altars will be smashed. I will slay your people in front of your idols. I will lay the dead bodies of the Israelites in front of their idols, and I will scatter your bones around your altars. Wherever you live, the towns will be laid waste and the high places demolished. This is getting serious judgment time right here. And so I, I call this Israel's judgment. Judgment is coming. Now, here's what's really interesting. He says, God says to Ezekiel first, speak to the people, but they won't listen. I love this. I think it was Chuck Missler that said, the people won't listen. So God says, now talk to the, to the land, <laughs> as if the land's going to listen any better. Does the land have the ability to hear? And that is an allegory. The land represents the region or all the, beyond Israel. But he's saying actually to the mountains of Israel. So some actually say that judgment is coming to the land and the mountains and the rivers and the hills, not just the people. Hmm, 
Is there a promise that God's going to not only judge the people one day again, but he's going to judge and the judgment's going to come against the, the land, the mountains, the rivers, the hills, the oceans, and all of creation, right? Isn't that sounding like revelation right there to anybody? So you see the parallel here uh, at a point of judgment. The judgment is coming not just to the people, not just to the sin, but to creation that Paul says has been groaning for God's return. I wonder what creation will actually be able to feel like and if we'll understand that more in the millennium than we do here in our in our three-dimensional bodies and stuff in the millennium when we're uh, transfigured like Christ was and we have our eternal body, will we understand more about nature than just the three-dimensional understanding uh, of it all? Um, I love uh, uh, Tom at, at his such young age, God still speaks to him. And, and as I was writing my first book, he wrote uh, Theology for Dummies, and he's now writing a whole thing about how God works within nature and and his economic system basically I'm probably using the wrong words there for you Tom probably making it all but basically how God works it all together uh, and one thing's dependent upon another and, and uh, you'll be able to read his here soon we'll once he gets into the place we'll put like we did theology for dummies how it's on our website we'll put it in you guys can read it. But definitely judgment has moved now from a personal to a corporate realm of the world. You can see that. Number two, he gives the high places are a reference to idols. So he says when he speaks to the high places, that's where the pagan person, especially in Israel, followed in their idolatry would do some of the same things. They would put their idols way up so that it would be above the people. And he's, he's saying, there's judgment coming to the high places because you put idols as in the high places when we are supposed to lift him up, not idols up, all right? The third thing within this, the cities, the temples, and the altars are all going to be desecrated by God's hand. Wow. Wait a minute. The cities, we can understand that. But we're talking the temple and the altars are included in the cities are all going to be desecrated by God's hand. That which he instructed them to build and to make, the first temple where he would live and he would be their God. And he's going to desecrate the temple and the altars and scatter your bones around the altars is a defiling act uh, in the temple. And that's what you just read in that. Now, this is, this is really interesting because it brings us to a point that you need to see this. God is not afraid to bring judgment against that which we would consider holy. Hmm. Now, I know that's not up there on the screen, but that's worth writing down a thing. God is not afraid to bring judgment against that which you and I would consider holy. And he's telling you that they've become just symbols of his holiness and people have desecrated him in their actions and their lives. So, so therefore, he's going to bring desecration that they could see it in their holy places. That's rough judgment. All right, let's look at verses, the rest of verse 6 through verse 9 because there's an attachment here that moves into our world especially, all right? So that your altars will be laid waste and devastated, your idols smashed in ruin, your incense altars broken down, and what you have made wiped out. Your people will fall slain among you, and you will know that I am, there's that phrase, you will know that I am the Lord. Woo. But I will spare some. Did I put that in yellow? I will spare some. That's an important phrase right there. That speaks to the remnant. God always has a remnant. I will spare some, for some of you will escape the sword when you are scattered among the lands and the nations. 
Then in the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me, how I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts, which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, which have lusted after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evil they have done and all their detestable practices. Whew. All right. Now, the language he's using is very important. That we'll get in that in just a few moments. But first, I want to I want to put the parallel here: the remnant in Israel and the remnant within the church. I believe this is the one of the biggest parallels between Ezekiel's day and our present world today. That there was only a remnant that was honoring God back here. And today, there's only a remnant that truly is trying to honor God. So, verse 8 says, The sparing of some speaks again to the remnant. This actually is, to some, a typecast or a foreshadow. The sparing of some is what the rapture is all about. He's sparing his church, those that are the remnant, those that are not the foolish versions, but the wise ones, he's going to spare them from all that's coming to pa pass. Okay? And so the sparing of some speaks to their day and it speaks to our future. That's hopeful in, in my mind and eyes. Now, there's a remnant in the church today that has not bent its heart to what I call the progressive gospel. Let me tell you how bad it has really gotten, and especially for our own movement right here. In our schools, just recently, again, another professor who they use his writings, at, especially here on the West Coast in Nampa and in Point Loma, he is toted as one of the untouchable tenure professors in theology uh, and that he speaks for many. As a matter of fact, the president of Nampa, Northwest Nazarene University, fired the man two and a half, almost three years ago. Because the president basically said, you don't teach Bible, you're teaching heresy, and he fires him. But because he had tenure and the student body so loved what he was teaching, that's apostasy, and half of the faculty the president ended up stepping down, and this professor was reinstated. He just put out a book that is going gangbusters within the clergy realm and out there totally. I just finished reading the book last night. It's called God Can't. Remember, open theism limits God. And his whole premise of this book is because God is loving, he can't, not he won't, he can't deal with evil. And that he has never been able to deal with evil. And that because he's loving, he will, a loving God will never be punitive and everybody makes it to heaven. Can you believe that's our movement, teaching that in our schools? Whew. We are praying very seriously. I've talked with several pastors and, and retired pastors of how do we bring this to rock their world, and, and usually it's in the dollar amount. It's not a lot of money when you think of one church, but if you get a lot of churches to say, we refuse to send any more allocations to our universities because you are not teaching the Bible. I, After reading the book, you can put a response on Amazon. I put on there, I don't know what God this man is talking about, and his name is Thomas J. Ord. He now, three years ago when he was in the battle with the president, he denied he was an open theist. He now advertises, this is how emboldening you get. What is this? So this is, again, showing here that there's only a remnant, and that which isn't following God gets emboldened in their sins. He actually advertises himself as the professor of open theology. Wow. My remark was, you do not know the God of the Bible because my God of the Bible not only can defeat evil, 
He promises to do so, and he's done it in the past. It's called a flood, Noah's day. It's called burning sulfur in Sodom and Gomorrah's day. It's called opening the earth and swallowing them up in Moses' day. Are you, are you catching this? God does deal with evil. He can and he will. And, they, and his whole premise is, no, but Jesus taught us that God has changed. And you're talking about a God of the past. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus never confronted evil. He got people to come alongside him. And Jesus wouldn't confront evil. And God's loving spirit can't deal with evil because his love overrides it. I said, well, you only have a short image of Jesus because the Bible says Jesus is coming a second time and he's got his sword drawn and he says, I'm coming to defeat evil. (laughs) So when you say he can't, not that he won't, he can't, you are describing a false God. I was the only one out of almost 70 reviews on the book that said this is a dangerous book. And several of them noted, said, you're out of touch with, with life. You're out of touch with, the, with where God has moved to. You're in a God of the past. I said, God doesn't change? What do you mean God of the past? Do you see how, this is the point here, there is a remnant in the church today that its heart hasn't bent to a progressive message. I fully understand our world doesn't, can't grapple or understand all the evil, sex trafficking, human trafficking, uh, you know, the, the slaying of people. They can't understand it, so they, they come up with this presence. If he is an all-powerful God and he's an all-loving God, then he would have done something. They don't put in the equation that this is a consequence of sin in the world and he is going to do something. His not doing something is grace at this point. They don't think that way anymore. They go, if you believe a God that can do something, isn't doing something, nobody wants that God. They make that bold act. Isn't that amazing? So, what Ezekiel's dealing with back here were some of the same issues. A remnant was only honoring God. We see that in our world today number three israel is considered adulterous that's what just came out at the end of this thing the the language in here that they have adulterous hearts and he actually uh tells them that their their practices are detestable this connotation here goes to revelation 17 where the church of the future and it could be the very near future is called the harlot Hello? Are you seeing the parallels? This is the adulterous God's people back here and the church of the future. Revelation calls him that church the harlot, the adulterous church. All right. This is the last section, uh, uh, 10 through 14, and I think it even opens this up even more, how God deals with an adulterous or a harlot church or people. All right, verse 10. And they will know. Oh, have you heard this already once or so tonight? Are you marking it? And they will know that I am the Lord. I did not threaten in vain to bring up this calamity on them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Strike your hands together and stamp your feet and cry out alas. This is what he's telling Ezekiel to do. Strike your hands, clap your hands, stomp your feet. And cry out, alas, because of all the wicked and detestable practices of the people of Israel. For they will fall by the sword, famine and plague. This refers back to chapter 5, the three things that are going to come that will be in thirds. That's going to make a big difference in their life here in the near future. One who is far away will die of the plague. One who is near will fall by the sword. And one who survives and is spared will die of famine. So will I pour out my, here's the word, wrath on them. And they will know, 
This is the third time he's saying this. Remember, he's going to say it 70 times. So uh, I won't point out all 70 because you'll get going, I know. And they will know that I am the Lord. Amen. Uh, when their people lie slain among their idols around their altars on every high hill and on all the mountains under every spreading tree and every leafy oak, places where they offered fragrant incense to all their idols, and I will stretch out my hand. Whose hand? God's hand. It's not bringing another people. This is God's hand coming against them. And I will stretch out my hand against them and make the land a desolate waste from the desert of Dibla, wherever they live. Then they, fourth time, they will know that I am the Lord. All right. The biggest parallel between Ezekiel's world and our world is it's a world that's coming under a sentence of God's wrath. Here's what you need to know. This is very important. Because the apostasy has hit the church, God's judgment comes first to the church in the last days, just as it came first to the nation of Israel. Not first to the world. But he purifies his bride. He brings judgment to the church. Very, very important. Now, if you're the remnant, you're protected from the wrath. But he will judge the church that is what he described here as Israel. And he describes in Revelation the adulterous spiritual person, the harlot. That's point number two. Now, watch this. This is so important. The time between his announcement of judgment and the actual judgment is called grace time. All right. Sunday night was again an actual announcement from the heavens of judgment. That's what the blood red moon. We've been having this for five years. So he's been announcing what God announces he delivers. He's saying judgment's coming, judgment's coming. Between the announcement and the actual act is grace time. Hello? Now, most of the signs have been for the whole world judgment is coming. But in 2017, we had a sign that was just for America. The black solar eclipse of the sun came across from the northwest down to the southeast and straight across the heartland for just America. That tells you that we've been three years almost, all right, two and a half from when it was, because uh, it was summer of that year and we're now just in 19. Two and a half years from the time that he started announcing judgment for a nation. Now, we know in 2024, there will be another solar eclipse that comes from the southwest, goes up through the northeast, and makes an X right over our country. A seven-year period from one to the other. Don't think that the whole seven years is grace time. Here's why I believe we needed to get into Ezekiel. What was happening to Israel? There were three waves of God's wrath. The first wave took Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into captivity. The second wave took Ezekiel and his wife and others into captivity. The third wave that's being told about here in Ezekiel here tonight doesn't come for another four years, and it will be the demolishing of Jerusalem and the temple. Don't think that America has still time before that second solar eclipse. Like that's now, now we're done. He already announced judgment. In prior history, no other nation needed two solar eclipses. As you go back from the Assyrians, remember when we were studying Jonah? Why were they so ready to listen to, to this man that came spit out of the fish it was because a couple years earlier there was a solar eclipse that went across the Assyrian empire and even the pagans knew this is not a good sign for us and so they repented and listened to Jonah 
you can trace through almost every empire that fell, you can trace a time of a solar eclipse going over just their empire, just like the solar eclipse didn't hit any other part of the world. It hit just the United States in 2017. The most recent one that you can trace to is you can go back to uh, the Turk Ottoman Empire in World War I. They were the ones ruling Israel and the solar eclipse went through their empire and they fell and Israel was set free for the Jews to start coming home. The migration out of the Balfour uh, Declaration took place and the Ottoman Empire had just a single solar eclipse. So don't be lulled to sleep that this is why point number two, the time between his announcement of judgment, the actual judgment is called grace time. We could have waves between now and 2024. I don't know if 2024 means it's done or, or that we get a wave or two then and then we get the final wave like Ezekiel if he's doing us exactly. And the reason why I put that parallel, you listen to every scholar that talks about the world. There are only two nations that said they were created to honor God, the nation of Israel and the United States. And so we parallel them in so many ways. Point number three, Ezekiel was told to clap his hands, stomp his feet about the judgment. In other words, he was supposed to get loud. You watch somebody, if everybody's there and just one person's clapping their hands, stomping their feet, you're going, whoa. He's wanting, God's wanting them to get their attention. Again, he's a just God. At judgment time, they can't say, you didn't warn us. You just came in and did all this to us and we never knew it was coming. He's going to say, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you. I had them do all these things. God's going to say to this world, I put signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and I warned you year after year after year after year. And you just kept on saying, they say these things happen anyway. But do they happen on specific days that tell a message? No. Yeah, we do have lunar eclipse, and yes, we have solar eclipse, but these are telling messages from God and have been for five years. Okay, to bring this all to what do we do with all this? Do we build our shelters, <laughs> get in, hoard our food, and hide? No, we're the remnant. Remember, the remnant is the one being held responsible to do the warning Ezekiel chapter 3, and if we don't warn the righteous people, the blood's on us. If we don't even warn the wicked person, their blood is on us. If we warn them, it's on them. So, I put two things together here in closing. Church growth or kingdom faithfulness. In 1970, in America, we only had a dozen churches, no matter what the denomination, no matter what the church name, only a dozen churches in all the United States that ran from 1,000 to 2,000 people in the 1970s. You can take a very small portion of L.A. and find more than a dozen churches that run over 2,000. The large church phenomenon, church growth, exploded but kingdom faithfulness didn't go with it. We have large churches, but not kingdom faithfulness. Number one, God is not concerned with how to grow your churches. He actually said that's his job. He said, I will build my church. Not you and I. He told us to be part of his kingdom. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them how to be a part of the kingdom. So that's number two. God's concern is with the church's faithfulness to his kingdom. That's why the language now, the adulterous language between this intimate relationship with God, why in the future he's going to call the church the harlot and why he called Israel the adulterous bride back here is because the faithfulness came to the temple, which he's going to allow them to desecrate it. And, and he just described how. I mean, he's going to allow the bones to be thrown around in a broken down, busted up temple. That's not 
evil doing it. That's why I noted it to you. Whose hand's doing this? This is the hand of God. We have a false religion out there that has swept through Christianity that says God will only do love. He won't venge. He won't be wrathful. Um, if God's the same yesterday as he is today and forevermore, he's ready to get very vengeful and wrath is coming. I believe it's come first through the abandonment aspect that he's left us to ourselves. And I've never noticed a people, a nation, so pulled apart. I thought we were poor, pulled apart under Obama's administration. I think we are 10 times worse pulled apart today. And we got a man that's trying to do what I think God wants to be done. Isn't that amazing? And so what's happening today is our lack of faithfulness as a church, and I'm not talking Nazarenes, I'm talking the whole body of Christ, and our lack of faithfulness to God as a nation has combined just like in the day of Ezekiel. Lord help us.